There we go. Okay, so ontology. Ontology is the field of metaphysics that's concerned with what exists. Okay? So if you were to have a list of your ontology, it's going to be the things that you think exist. So you might say chairs and tables exist. If you believe in ghosts, then ghosts would be on your list of ontology. If you believe in God, then God would be on your list of ontology. So it's your proposal of things that you think exist. What exists? So I've got a uh, paper airplane here. I made one before class. And I'm going to ask you guys, how many things do I have here? Okay, how many things do I have here? So, like a simple answer might be one. All right, we've got one airplane. Let's look at some possible answers I've come up with. The first thing is I've got two things. I've got one aeroplane and one piece of paper. All right. Any problems with that? One aeroplane and one piece of paper. So I've got two things here. Does that seem a bit silly? It does, doesn't it? You, know, you might say, no, that's, that's ridiculous. The plane and the paper are the same one thing. You have one thing, the plane and the paper are identical. Are they identical? Well, watch this. The paper still exists, the plane does not. Okay? So if they were identical, what does it mean to be identical? It means they share all of the same properties. All right? But look now, the paper exists, the plane doesn't. I made the plane, I didn't make the paper, and the paper existed before the plane and continues to exist after I've destroyed the plane. All right, so it sort of seems like, well, they're not identical. How, could we, how can we describe how many things I have here? Another answer might be, you don't have a plane, you've just got a septillion atoms. So that's 10 to the power of 24. That's how many atoms they reckon are in one sheet of paper. 10 to the power of 24. So like, I've got my whiteboard here for a reason. Let's talk about how many things. So 10 to the 24, that means a 1 followed by 24 zeros. Okay, so you can see, like there's only the 9 there, it's a massive number. Right, lots of atoms in this piece of paper. Alright, but then it's like, well, does that mean that there's no plane here? When I'll, I'll fold it back up quickly. Is there no plane? Is there just atoms? Maybe there's one plane and a septillion atoms, which means I have one septillion and one things. Uh -huh. Maybe a more appropriate answer. I have one aeroplane and it is made of a septillion atoms. Okay? So let's look at the three answers we went through. The first thing, the first thing was purposely ridiculous. You've got two things. You've got one aeroplane and one piece of paper. You said, well that can't be the case. Paper, the paper and the airplane are not identical. You've got just atoms. Well, I mean, does this plane exist? Or I've got one airplane and it's made of, it is composed of a septillion atoms. All right. So given those three descriptions, um, does, did, does anyone have any problems? I, I think the last one is probably the most appropriate for us for now. Does anyone have any problems with that description of the aeroplane? No, is everyone pretty happy with that? That's probably how you describe it, giving a bit of prodding in the right direction. Good. Okay, so I'm introducing to you guys the word simple. Okay, philosophers use this word simple to describe what is the most fundamental unit of reality that everything else is built from. So we've got you, when we talk about the universe, we tend to describe everything that exists. That's what the universe means. Okay, The universe means everything that exists. And the universe is, I'm putting here some mathematical symbols again, greater than. The universe is composed of galaxies. It's estimated within our universe, there's between 100 to 400 million other galaxies. Okay, What are galaxies made of? Okay, our, What's our own galaxy that we live in? The Milky Way. Okay, and within each galaxy, they reckon again, 100 to 400 million star systems. 
So we've got universes composed of galaxies, galaxies composed of star systems. Star systems are made up of, well, stars and planets, all right? What are planets composed of? Planets are made up of rocks and other things, but I'm simplifying here just to talk about composition. What are rocks made of? Molecules, okay? So what, what's a molecule? It's a combination of atoms arranged in a particular manner. That's, um, that's what a molecule is. And what are molecules made of? Atoms. And we can go further, and we do, even though we've never seen an atom, never seen an atom, but we'll talk about that when we get to epistemology. When we go further, we talk about these subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons. We've never seen them, but they match our model. That's how we, that's how we sort of know, or we, we believe they exist because they operate. Atoms work as if they exist. They're made up of, in turn, quarks, okay? And then quarks, in turn, uh, it's hypothesized, they're made up of what's called superstrings, all right? And at the moment, that's as far as our model goes. It goes down that far and says, that's the most fundamental unit, that's the simple, the superstring. That's what quantum physics is describing at the moment. If you're just talking about chemistry, then you're just dealing with atoms, okay? If you're talking about biology, then you can talk about a few chemical reactions, but generally you talk about a higher level of composition, okay? So we're going to use the word simple to say whatever that most fundamental unit is, okay? Who knows how far down it goes? Maybe these superstrings, maybe that's a whole world inhabited by conscious beings, all right? So when we talk about composition, there's, there's, two, there's two hypotheses, well, there's three really. There's the one that we understand, which is where we've got a, a, some fundamental symbol and some ultimate composition. Okay, the universe and superstrings. That's the that's the current scientific theory at the moment. But it could go downwards forever. That is, you can keep dividing these things up and up and up ad infinitum, infinitely, just going downwards. There is no there is no ultimate simple. You think of the Babushka dolls here. Okay, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It still exists. It's just smaller and smaller and smaller. You can keep dividing it up. Okay, that's what we call a gunky universe. Right. Well, it's a gunky universe. The opposite is we still we have a fundamental simple, all right, might be a superstring, but nothing finally composes. That's what we call a junky universe, where you just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger composites. Okay? So what, what is a composite? It's something that's made up of other things. Here we've got the paper. The, the airplane is made of a septillion atoms. The atoms are made of quarks. The quarks are made of superstrings. Is there is that the last level? Okay. Is it just superstrings here? All right. So, according to our ontology, do chairs exist? All right. So here's a pretty straightforward idea. Like I think if you were going to talk to someone about, well, what does it mean to exist? And you can debate this. All right. But a pretty straightforward idea is to say. If there's a physical manifestation of it, if you can see it, touch it, feel it, okay, if you can sense it, then it exists. All right, so I've got a chair here. So chairs exist. Unicorns don't. Okay, unicorns do not exist. So that, that, that's the definition we're going to stick with today here. Okay, so question, do chairs exist? Yes. Okay, how about islands? Do islands exist? Well, let's check. Is there at least one island somewhere? Yep, okay, it's a, it's a body of land surrounded by water. You can look it up in the dictionary, you know, like the dictionary might be a, um, an, a list of approved nouns and you can figure out the ones that actually exist. So yes, islands exist, okay? Islands exist. How about in-cars? Have you guys heard of in-cars before? Put your hand up if you've heard of in-cars. Okay, put your hand up if you haven't heard of in-cars. Cool, okay, excellent. Well, you guys are about to learn about in-cars. So an in-car is a car that is inside a garage. All right. Do in-cars exist? Is there, located anywhere on planet Earth right now, a car in a garage? Yeah, so do in-cars exist? Based on our definition, they do, don't they? But based on our definition, you say, I suppose so, but you've sort of just made that up. They're not really like something that exists, all right? Not like islands, like if we think about islands, yeah, of course islands exist, you know, I can see those, they're 
I can see what they are, I can, I can go and visit one. In cars, you know, that's just something you've made up. They don't really exist. Like an in car, if you think about it, an, an in car, that's just a relationship between what a car and a garage. It's not, it's not a thing on itself, it's just a relationship between a car and a garage. Well, how about an island? That's just a relationship between land and water. It's not really something that exists, but for some reason it seems an island seems heaps more real to us than an Inca. Any ideas? Jason? I think it's because a car would be the same whether it was in a garage or not. Like if you had that exact same car, there would be a car on the outside of it. Yep. Like an island, where it's just an island. So, yeah, it, it being above water gives it properties that it doesn't have when it's below water? Yeah. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, any, any ideas to counter that? So, like, a, a car being in a garage also has properties that it doesn't have being outside of the garage. For instance, it's not going to get wet when it rains or get snowed on or have its gas freeze or something like that. So this is a tricky question, isn't it? We've got islands seem to us so obviously to exist, but in cars seem like I've just made them up, okay? But if you think in cars were bad, have you guys heard of trogs? Okay, a trog, who wants to guess what a trog is? Please. It is a dog on a tree. A trog is the composite being, it's got a dog part and a tree part, and this is a trog. Okay. Do trogs exist? Yeah. Say, okay, we're starting to say yes. Well, can we have a more definition of a trog? Like, is the dog attached to the tree? No, it's not attached. It's not even touching it. They're just together. They're just in the same in the same space. There's, a, there's the dog part, and there's the tree part, and together they compose a trog. Is there like a proximity limit? Like, the dog has to be well, certainly... We, we could set one if you want, but... I don't think the dog might like the other trog. Like if it's near a tree. Like what if, what if there's, there's a dog tree. and then there's a tree like 50 metres away? Yeah, that would be a trog, wouldn't it? There's, it's just a, got, they're really far apart. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, trog exists. Does that mean every dog's a trog? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Well, then, so, that means trogs exist, trogs exist. Yeah. Based on what you were saying, the trog exists. Yeah. So, 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 but the, yeah, you guys yeah. have picked this up, that's the point. It's ridiculous. Like then every composite exists. You know, this chair and this table make a table. And you know, this, this chair and this table make a table as well. Does, does everything compose to make something unique? Some of these realities are more real than others. Like islands seem made way more real than in cars, and in cars seem at least a little bit more real than trogs, right? So what we're talking about here, this field is called myriology, okay? Myriology is, so when you think of ontology, what is? Myriology is the part of it that studies parts and holes. What's a part, what's a whole? Um, what's the difference between a part and a whole? And so we have two camps that we're going to investigate here. Ontological realists, okay, so you know the language, it can be a bit hard, but this means objective and mind independent composites exist. Okay, what does that mean? Island, all right, that word island it's not just a useful idea that humans have made up to describe reality. It is reality. Islands really exist. Okay? In cars, all right? We go going back to in cars. In cars, as a composite, as a composite, aren't just a product of the human mind that's made up by me for the purposes of tricking you. They really exist. They're composed of a car and a garage. Trogs really exist. These composites really exist. If we're going to say that composites really exist, we need a way to distinguish between the real ones and the sort of the ones that seem a bit made up. What's the difference between them? This is what we're going to be unpacking a bit. So that's what ontological realists say. They say composites exist. They are real. They they exist regardless of whether a human mind is there to, to cut up reality that way. Then you have anti-realists, ontological anti-realists. They say, there's no such thing as ordinary objects, as composites. They do not exist. It's all just 
atoms in the void or superstrings in the void. All right, so you can see we have these two competing theories. Does, does the role of paper actually exist or is it just, that's our, our way of cutting up reality to understand it so we can use it for our own purposes? A pragmatic way, what does that mean? What does pragmatic mean? Like practical? Yeah, practical. It means it's useful, it's practical. We can use it. If we can use it, that's why we do it, okay? It's all about it being useful, not necessarily the truth, but useful as the truth. So composites have lots of problems. Um, and so you, like you, you're tempted to say, of course chairs and tables exist, and of course islands exist, and of course in cars don't exist. They're just ridiculous, all right? So, so one of the problems is, well, why do we allow some composites and not others? Where do we draw that line? Um, because if you're just looking at that, you might think it is a bit useful. So you might remember this from last year. This is the ship of Theseus. So we're going to go through these problems with composites. This is the first one, identity. This is the ship of Theseus. He was a philosopher. He wasn't. He was a hero. He's a Greek hero, um, but he's got, he liked philosophy. That's why he's got his philosophy flag there, okay, in his boat. And he went sailing from Athens, and he's sailing to Turkey. He's going on an adventure, and um, and the the front part of his hull got barnacles on it, so he needed to replace it. So he went and he put that away and went to the, the shipyard and bought a new front hull and put that on. And then he went on his merry way back from Turkey and he's sailing back to Athens to see his mum. Okay? He gets back to Athens and on the way they were attacked by a kraken. Okay, what's a kraken? A big giant squid octopus thing and it ripped the back part of their boat off. Okay, so. He needed to go to the boat shop and get another back part of the boat. So he went to the boat shop, got the back part of the boat and put it on. And he thought, while I'm at it, you know, I've, I've replaced that. I may as well replace the cabin as well. So he went and got a new cabin. Okay. And then he sailed on his merry way. He's got his flag still. All right, not working. There we go. Okay, sail on his merry way. Then, unbeknownst to him, his rival went and collected all the parts that he'd thrown out and assembled into a boat of his own, okay, and went sailing on the seas. <laughs> so the question is, which one is the ship of Theseus? Okay, it's a question of identity. There's two temptations. We're tempted to say two things. Okay, who would like to volunteer an answer? Emma. Well, that one is Theseus' ship because of the purpose. Yeah, okay, because of its because of its purpose. Yep. And the other one is because of the material. Excellent. You remember from last year. Yes, very good. So we can say this is it because of its its form and the purpose that it takes, and this is it materially speaking. Yep, I think that's a good answer to divide it up like that. But my question is, <clears throat> which one is his ship? Not which one is his formally or which one is his materially. Which one is his ship? Okay, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, we've got two temptations. We've got this to say formally and this to say materially. But you can ask the same question about the human body. Okay, if your body's made of atoms and they say, you know, every seven years or whatever, you replace the atoms from the food you eat and you defecate and you get rid of atoms and new atoms come in. Okay, so you're not the same physical person you were seven years ago. So then I'm saying, well, which one's you? The, the body you had seven years ago or the body you have now? Um, so this is a problem with composite. Because it's like, well, which one is the ship of Theseus? Which one has its identity? Okay, the sorties paradox. Um, Sorrites paradox, sorry. So I've got two ways I can explain this. The first one is if we have a rock, and let's say we've got a rock. Remember how we're talking about composites? Composites. Rocks are composed of atoms or molecules. So I'm going to put, just draw a few atoms on here. This rock looks more like a cookie, I suppose, but it's a rock. All right. So we have a rock here, but we also have the rock that's made up of these parts as well. Like that's a rock there in itself, isn't it? And we have the rock that's made up of these parts here. All right. And we've got the rock that's made up of this part, 
and the rock that's made up of that. In fact, we can do that ad infinitum, giving in a rock that is even more than a septillion atoms. And this can lead to a bit of overcounting. You can say, well, we've got, we've got this rock and we've got that rock. We've got this rock and that rock and that rock and that rock. We've got four rocks there. Okay? What's sort of wrong with that form of reasoning? It seems to bear some sort of unity, doesn't it? I've got one rock, it seems to be united somehow. But is that, is that a reality or is that just the way that we conceive it? We impose that on it. And if we impose that on it, well, that means we can impose this on it as well, this division. And it means we can impose another division on it as well. Okay? Here's, here's another little uh, thing we got too. So I've got for my uh, chess players, chess and checkers, so we've got the queen, okay? And we've got three of these uh, checker pieces, all right? Two of them are black, one of them is red. We're going to pretend that those are the symbols, okay? So I'd say, how many things do I have here? And we've got one, two, three, four. We've got four simple things here, all right? But hang on, there's more. Wait, there's more. Like, guys, you've got to consider the mega queen, okay? Which is when you have a queen on top of a checker. So now we had the four checkers, the, the four simples, and now we've got this extra thing as well, this queen and the checker. We've got five things. But you can also get a mega, mega queen. All right, so we've got, now we've got six things. And you can even combine all of them together to get a yas queen. <laughs> so these are, these are the problems with, with um, composites. All right? And if we're going to say, yes, composites exist, yes, chairs, tables, all other ordinary objects, they do exist, they are real, we need to solve these problems. How are we going to solve? Okay, the last one, this is probably the hardest one, is about causal redundancy. Who can remember what uh, what Occam's razor is? Uh, it's like where you only decide the most likely something. Yes, yep, yep. The most likely, the simplest ex explanation is the truest one. So an example might be, like from our test last year, oh, uh, my friend didn't text me back, okay? Option A, their battery went flat. Option B, they were abducted by aliens and taken to the planet Mars where they're being studied as a human guinea pig. All right, which one seems more likely? Okay, their battery went flat. So Occam's razor says we should use the simplest explanation. Okay, the simplest explanation is more likely to be true. When we talk about composites, okay, we can explain. We, let's take the chair again, for example. We can explain every interaction this chair has with reference to its atoms. We don't, need, we don't need a physical description of the chair. We can describe every interaction it has with you and with I in terms of atoms in the void. All right? It's a bit like, and this is the way that philosophers describe it, when you turn the gas on on your stove to, let's say, boil some pasta, it's, it's the flame that heats the stove, right? And they say, no, no, well, actually, there's this magical substance called boilio, and it comes out, and it, and it helps heat the gas, and if the gas wasn't there, it would still heat the pasta, but the boilio is there, and we know it's working. That's what a chair is like. It's like saying, it's, I mean, the chair exists, right? Even though it's made of atoms, and if the chair, if, if we didn't have the idea of chair, the atoms would still be there. Okay. It's a tough one to understand. Alright, so this process is called reductionism. All right? And it's the process of reducing some complex phenomena to its parts. And so that's what we're asking here is can we simplify these things just to what they're made of? And I've purposely chosen some qualitative things here. Okay? Who's read Harry Potter? Put your hand up, please. A couple of us, most half the class. Good, okay, excellent literature. Is Harry Potter just ink on a page? Okay, materially speaking, yes it is, all right? But there's a whole qualitative experience you get from reading that novel, all right? How about a piece by Beethoven? Does anyone like classical music or Beethoven? Jensen, yes. Michael likes a little bit when he's playing chess. 
okay? Um, according to, to Spotify, okay, or according to you know, it's digi the digital piece as it exists, in terms of binary code, it is just a bunch of ones and zeros stored on a computer somewhere. Okay? Love, that's experience we've all had, hopefully, towards someone in our lives. All right? Uh, is it just a chemical reaction? I understand this isn't the reaction for it, but is love, is, is, that, is that it? You know, is it just these, these atoms just moving around? Or is it something so much more qualitative than that? Is a human being just a bag of skin? A bag of carbon, oxygen and nitrogen, the fundamental building blocks of life. Other residual elements, but fundamentally, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. So this is the question that like, we're going to stick with, because now that we're talking about it, it does seem like we just cut up reality in a way that seems convenient to us. That chairs don't really exist, we impose existence on them. That's sort of how it seems. But what is more real to you? The chair or the atoms that make up the chair? Okay? You can't see the atoms, you can't taste the atoms, you can't touch them, you can't interact with them, but you can see, touch, you could taste the chair if you felt brave enough. Uh, you can interact with the chair, we can't interact with the atoms. So it's, it's odd, isn't it? Like the chair is more real to us, yet this sort of thought pattern is leading us to chairs don't exist. Okay, so we have these two possibilities, right? Remember, we have the ontological realists. They say, yes, ordinary objects exist. Composites do exist. But if that's the case, then we need to solve these problems, the problems of composites. Okay? If we say, no, they don't exist, if we're an ontological anti-realist, well, we've got the hard problem of consciousness to worry about. Other questions might be, why do we act as if they exist? Why do chairs and tables and all other ordinary objects seem more real to us than their component parts? One guy says, this is Peter Van Inwagen, talking about uh, human beings. Okay, he says, obviously people believe they exist and something must believe it exists in order to have that thought. Therefore, people exist. Any, any criticisms or ideas about that? So one response is, like when we're talking about determinism, okay, remember when we talk about determinism, we say, yeah, but it looks like, it feels like, it, it seems like I've got free will. And people say, you don't really, that's just an illusion. All right? Um, it looks like, it seems like, it feels like we exist. You don't, you don't really exist. It's just an illusion. Um, well, what is it that's being deceived? Like, doesn't something have to exist in order to be deceived, to be to be under an illusion? So again, that question, what's more real? The chair or the atoms? Okay, that's, that's a brief introduction to ontology, the problems of ontology. Do these objects really exist or are they an imposition of our, our, our will onto the world? Uh, what our, just our way of cutting it up and understanding it. Does anyone want to say anything about it? Any thoughts? Excellent. So these are the questions we will answer in our uh, in our journal, and I can flip back through the PowerPoint. I might upload it to the um, uh, sector now, so you guys can access it. But let's have a go at answering these, and then we'll have a look at Westworld.